Okay. So welcome to the Cape Elizabeth School Board regular school board meeting, business meeting at 6.30 on Tuesday, April 14th, 2020 via Zoom video conference. Uh, my name is Heather Altenberg. I'm the chair of the school board and I'm calling this meeting to order. We have a flag on our screens. If we could all stand up and pledge allegiance to the flag, we'll get started. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, the flag to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America. America. And, to and to the republic, republic for, which, for it which, stands, which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God, God indivisible. indivisible. With, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. I just banged my head. <laughs> I kept hearing all of you say it back to me. I felt like it was a little Simon Says. Um, okay, we are- Mar um, Marcy, can you take the flag down? Yeah. Okay. I just wanna uh, go over a few little basics about this. If people could press mute themselves, and then when you want to speak, um, I'll be looking around. We all look like we fit on the same screen. So you can just raise your hand and I'll keep my eye open or you can do the little hand icon. Uh, here comes Piper Strunk back in. Um, so that's how that will go. And then for school board members, when it comes to actual voting, um, Donna, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but we actually have to speak. We can't just raise our hands for this. And so if you look at the agenda, it's got um, little boxes. And so I'm just gonna go through and call, for example, Heather Altenberg, yay or nay, and I'll say yay or nay, and then I'll go through and we'll mark it down. So it's gonna take just a smidge longer than usual, but that's the process. So, um, all right, before people mute, are there any questions about how, the, I know that's not a typical question, um, in a board meeting, but does anybody have a question about how this is being run? And other than that, it should be pretty regular. Okay, so uh, item number one, are there any adjustments to the agenda? No. See none. Um, may I have a motion for item two, approval of school board minutes, uh, March 10th, 2020. I move we approve the board minutes from March 10th, 2020. Can second. I have a second? I'm sorry, who was that? Laura? Laura second, yes. Um, and then Heather Altenberg, yay. Kimberly Carr? Yay. Phil Saucier? Yay. Elizabeth Cypress? Yay. Uh, Nasser Shear? Yay. Hope Straw? Yay. And Laura Danino? Yay. Great. Thank you. Um, I, before moving on to item three, I just want to welcome you all. I'm sorry I got caught up in the Pledge of Allegiance and the flag and the whole Zoom, but thank you for being here. Thanks for finding your time and your way to make it. Um, and those who are watching, welcome. Um, item three, comments by student representatives. Hello, everyone. It seems a little weird to be chatting over FaceTime or Zoom, but um, so it's been, it's definitely been an adjustment doing everything online. Um, but I think teachers um, have definitely, um, are, get, are getting more comfortable with everything in like the technology and the, the programs and whatever. Um, and I think communication and flexibility has really been um, important and, um, you know, in, in the success of, the, of this um, online school situation. Um, so our schedules are basically maroon. We have maroon, gold, and white days. Um, on maroon days, we have four, on maroon um, and gold days, we have four periods. And maroon days are on Mondays and Wednesdays, and gold days are on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then white days are basically a, an advisory day to catch up and to um, discuss concerns, comments, and um, just make sure everyone's doing well, um, just in life in general. And then um, regarding AP exams, um, so the College Board came out with, a, with um, a new way of doing it. So that's 45 minutes at home 
online. Um, most of them are the ones I have, uh, I'm taking, are two free response questions. So they've sort of found a way to allow people to take them. But you can also, if you don't want to do that, I know some colleges are accommodating it and some colleges are raising their standards. So um, if people don't want to take it, it's free cancellation. So it's been um, definitely good that way. So people are deciding whether they want to make that commitment um, financially and um, time-wise. So, and that is the week of, they are the week of May 11th. And yeah, so that is that. And then yeah. Piper wants to add something. Um, and so on another note, um, having to do with a lot of these changes happening, um, this has definitely been a really kind of difficult time for our seniors, um, just because this is considered like one of the best, uh, like the most important few months as a senior. Um, so it's definitely been very disappointing, um, but everyone's really lucky to have each other and getting through this. Um, and we had a really nice meeting. Some students and staff and Mr. Shedd had a really great meeting to talk about other ways that we can um, still have fun our senior year um, and graduation and things like that. Um, we've all come to the realization that this isn't gonna be a traditional um, senior year and that's okay. Um, and so I think the faster, students can really wrap their head around that, the more fun and stuff we can have. Um, but, oh no, I lost everyone. <laughs> um, can you guys still see me? We can hear you okay. and see you. Sorry, my screen went black. Um, and as a lot of you know, we've moved graduation um, as of right now to Wednesday, July 29th. Um, that is only also if the coronavirus is, um, kept like under wraps and um, is controlled by then. Um, but a lot of students are really happy and thankful that we can have a graduation um, and everything like that. Um, and also something that I wanted to bring up to the school board, which I'm sure a lot of you have gotten messages about and stuff like that, would definitely be um, having to do with uh, John Holdridge. A lot of students have reached out and had a lot of concerns about that um, because he does play a very vital role in our school um, from everything from um, organizing and orchestrating mentoring in the elementary school and middle school and stuff like that um, and also running uh, the SDL program which is the student driven learning program where students are able to uh, kind of like create their own um, course of study um, and do any everything from this year we have someone making a school video to art projects to stuff like that so that's definitely something that students want to make sure that is continued. Um, and so I, I'm sure a lot of you have received emails. I know that that was a big thing circulating around. Um, so just talking about that um, and explaining that to students, I think students really wanted explanation about stuff like that. So um, that's pretty much it on my end. If anyone has any questions, let me know. Um, well, thank you, Piper and Allie. It sounds like, um, from your perspective, you're keeping a positive outlook on the senior year and um, I commend you for that. I really do. And I hope that you come up with some really creative ways to help celebrate with Principal Shedd and uh, find a way to honor it and mark it because it is a special time. So, um, and I would like to refer people back to last Tuesday's meeting. We had a lot of conversation um, about the position um, in the budget conversation about the position of the um, extended learning opportunities coordinator. So if anybody is interested, there's a lot of information back in last week's meeting. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, comments from the public on the agenda? Yes, when? I can't hear you. You have to unmute. You gotta unmute down in the bottom left, I think. There okay. we go. Yep. Been muted and unmuting a lot lately. I know. Um, so before I before I start, I just wanted to, to I know that people are talking about remote learning, but I did not see it specifically on the agenda. I know that one of you I spoke with one of the administrators, and uh, the person said that they were going to be talking about. It. I didn't know whether it was okay. I just had a brief comment about it. I don't know if that's all right or not. Um, I'm to say thanking and double checking let Donna answer this. 
Uh huh. Go ahead, Donna. It's the continuity of education plan. It is on there. Oh, okay. That's what it is. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we all call it remote. But I appreciate. Learning. I appreciate you double checking. Yep. Okay. So the other thing is on the budget uh, on the agenda. So all right. So my name is Wynn Phillips. I'm the president of the Cape Elizabeth Education Association and an English teacher at the high school. The first thing I'd like to address is the district's plan for remote learning. I know we are all hoping to return to school next September. However, there is the real possibility we won't be able to do that. And even if we do return, there is also the possibility that another outbreak could cause the year to be interrupted. In both scenarios, we will be back to remote learning. I encourage this, the board to direct Cape Elizabeth schools to have a plan in place. In developing this plan, it is integral that the administration work closely with teachers, staff, and parents, and get input from students. These people have been in the trenches dealing with the successes and failures of remote learning and to move without those groups being a part of the process would be folly. Now I'd like to speak as an English teacher at the high school. In 2005, a grant from the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation helped establish the Achievement Center. The AC, as it is known, has become a centerpiece of our school. It is where students can meet one-on-one -on -one with teachers of math and English. The assistance these students receive is, in, uh, is invaluable. This year's shift to remote learning is something we never could have anticipated, and the way we meet with our students now can in no way replace what happens daily in the classroom. Because of this, we can anticipate that in September, some of our students will have skills deficits, and many of them will require one-to-one -one remediation. This is the kind of work that would normally happen in the AC. However, due to budget decisions that have been made during the very pandemic we are experiencing, the chances of having a math teacher in the AC are remote at best. As for an English teacher, there is a slim chance that one might be available for a couple of periods, but that is all. I know there has been talk about peer tutors filling the void, but this is unrealistic. Colleges employ student tutors, but not only are they paid, but they also go undergo extensive training. Additionally, in my experience helping students with writing, they often share personal things that they would in no way feel comfortable sharing with a peer. So issues of confidentiality loom large. I can't speak for the math department, but in my time in the AC, I often see students meeting with a math teacher. Acquiring math skills carries over into the sciences. As for, this, as for English, the assistance we provide in the AC isn't just relegated to work done in our classes. I've assisted students with papers in social studies and science. I've also gone over many college essays. None of this will happen if the current budget moves forward. It is up to you to decide if the impact the budget will have is worth it for our students. Thank you. Thank you, Wynne. Uh, are there any other comments from the public? Okay, seeing none, uh, next up we have uh, item five is presentations, uh, but we don't have any presentations this evening. So we'll move to item six, which is administrative reports, the principal's updates. Who would like to go first? Jason, thank you. Can't hear you though. You have to, there we go, perfect. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so it certainly is an interesting time right now. Staff has been working really hard and students have been working hard and parents have been working hard. So um, I think kind of the overarching, um, the banner that um, we're continuously trying to remind everyone of as remote learning extends for the rest of the year is that no one signed up for this. So teachers didn't, students didn't, and parents didn't. So we wanna, um, as this extends and we get more comfortable with it, we, we want to just continue having discussions and coming back around to the fact that um, the pandemic is affecting families in so many different ways. Uh, some folks are um, perhaps almost enjoying their time and some folks are really, really struggling. So um, we're just keeping that in mind and that includes staff, students and parents. So we're keeping that in mind every day and just reminding ourselves of that. Uh, so, we, myself and, and Sarah Forey Pettit, we've been really working to support teachers. Um, and so the ways that we've done that so far, 
um, you know, we've created clarity around, um, around the um, practice of remote learning for teachers when necessary and, and when requested from teachers to try to, to um, be able to support them as much as possible. Um, the all our meeting structures are continuing on so we meet with our grade level team leaders every week we meet with grade level teams every week um, and it's really important at this time to just be available for even spontaneous discussions for um, with teachers or teams of teachers or individuals who are um, possibly have questions or successes to share or are struggling in certain areas um, so it's really about being available um, and just being compassionate. Uh, so we've also been surfacing needs just for PD for technology, working really closely with Tom Sheltre, who has been doing an amazing job of um, cr creating tutorials for Google Meet, Google Classroom. Um, he is available by text, phone, or, or Google Meet with teachers all the time. He's just constantly promoting that. Uh, and he's making an impact. So um, teachers are getting a lot of professional development. That's another thing to remember that some folks are not as comfortable with the technology and it's a huge shift for them. So again, just trying to be compassionate every step of the way. Um, I, that's all I have to share tonight, unless there are any questions for me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Troy, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, I kind of echo everything Jason said. And, you know, at the middle school, it's slightly different because the 5 6 is a little bit different than the 7 8 as far as student independence um, and what we're kind of experiencing at those levels. And, and I think expectations and the challenges of um, that the teachers face. Families might have a kid in a uh, student in fifth and sixth grade, they may also have one in seventh and eighth grade. and and seeing the different expectations, I think, and intensity level or the number of times they do a Google Meets versus um, for the older kids versus the younger. I just think there's a little bit of difference. We also, I think Jason put it really well when he said nobody signed up for this. Um, I have a lot of teachers that have learned a ton. And I, have, and, and I think sometimes we have to realize there's gonna be a cycle of, of kind of getting our feet wet honeymoon stage to really getting it going smoothly, the remote learning. And then at some point, I think there's gonna be a little bit of burnout because our teachers continue to push more and more. And I, I think really our job is obviously to support them, but to remind them to take care of themselves, their selves and their families. Um, they have a lot going on at their ho own homes with, with their children or elderly parents and, or kids away at, you know, out of state that never, got back and so there's a bunch of things going on and I just think as leaders this is our time to support them and really and be, play a vital part in that. Jonathan Werner has been um, incredible much like Tom Sheltray from what Jason said he has um, been there to meet kind of every question and do the research and the legwork to go in and, and kind of help whereas teachers are not kind of left on their own so instead of admin really providing I think the ultimate amount of support. Really, they're going to different places right now to meet the needs that they, they have. We meet as team leaders. We're gonna start meeting with individual teams, but really the feedback has been really positive overall from the parents. There are always some concerns. We're trying, it's not a one size fits all model and the word flexibility has to be really used a lot to make this work. The obviously on the horizon, the big questions for us are around, you know, for lack of a better term, grading or assessing and how to keep kids motivated and how to show the appreciation for the work they are doing. And obviously really high quality and quick feedback is part of that. But I think it's our job to also really let the students know somehow we appreciate all their efforts in the families. And that's kind of an after April break thing for us that we're really working on. And I think it's gonna be some kind of focusing on student engagement. Um, but so that's kind of where we are. And I just, I'm, I continue to be impressed every day with what our teachers have been able to pull together. And we, we just have to remember for a fifth grader to be checking seven Google classrooms is overwhelming. And I know that we have a schedule and they should never really need to do um, over five, uh, four different people a day. But reality is 
we all look for all of our work and, and we're constantly contacting. So we just, we always want to try to keep that in our mind. And we have a, a system started for really reaching out and supporting students that are kind of, um, we're struggling to make consistent contact with, and that's going through our guidance and social work, um, social workers. So a lot's going on. I continue to be amazed at what we're, what's happening and the parents have been absolutely incredible and in understanding. So it's been, I would say a success for the, the cards that we were dealt. Any questions? Thank you, Troy. Um, and then Jeff. Hello. Um, my comments are not surprisingly going to overlap with Jason and Troy's pretty significantly. Um, I wanted to start off with a little bit of data. Um, earlier this week, I, I asked teachers to complete a survey, and about half the teachers did, maybe a little bit more than that at this point, just to get a sense of what, how they would describe the students' level of engagement during remote learning. Um, this is the fifth week we're in it now, and I sort of asked teachers to describe by um, decile bands. So it was essentially zero to twenty percent engaged, twenty to forty percent, and on up to up to eighty to one hundred percent. And sort of defining engagement as a combination of attendance and um, work completion. And I, I told teachers I didn't want to spend a long time on this, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a mathematically precise go through your grade books thing, but it was an impression. And the interesting thing to me was across all, all sort of course levels of the school, our teachers said that um, roughly 80% of our students are engaged at a, in remote learning at a rate that they would describe between 80 to 100%, um, which I think is really impressive. And 90% were showing engagement of 60 to 80%. So, so we're talking about um, a relatively small number of students who are below 60% engagement and we're working hard on those kids. But I, I think that's a testament to the kids and, and to our teachers and to our parents as well who are sort of supporting the kids behind the scene. I also did a peak um, an hour or two ago. I was curious, so I just did a random survey of about 50 students in power school, just went through their grades just to get a sense of where they are and are there some significant slippage that I would notice significantly and I didn't notice that at all. I think I did look at about 50 students. There are a couple of students who are significantly um, struggling. They are students who, not surprisingly, are students who struggle with attention issues in regular school, so it becomes even harder to sort of navigate the challenge of remote school. But for the vast majority of students, their grades, to the extent those are fair indicators, are within a, a couple of points either way or where they, of where they were the first half of the year. Some are significantly higher, some are, are a little bit lower, uh, but really not significant numbers of students who are dropping off, I would say. Um, I would say in terms of, because I've been in a, a, a three regional meetings now of, of school principals, of mostly principals in Cumberland County. I would say what's a little bit different about our approach to remote learning really from the first day was we've incorporated more sort of synchronous live video conferencing, similar to what we're doing right now. Um, as a significant part of our effort at remote learning. Exceptions were for teachers, and there are some who have, sig who have significant child care obligations or, or elderly care, family care obligations in their own home. Um, and parents and students have been super understanding of that. But my sense is even those teachers with those issues have begun to um, incorporate more meetings, more live teleconferencing, and we're getting good feedback from parents and students about really appreciating that um, live meeting opportunity. Um, I will just echo what Jason and Troy have said. I'm super proud of our teachers. They have learned so much in such a small amount of time. They are working their tails off, um, uh, making up lesson plans, deli delivering instruction in ways that they've never done before. Um, so instructing, I had a story today of a teacher who's not our most technologically um, sophisticated, um, I will say, who for the last week and a half has been using digital whiteboards and has developed a real familiarity with that, um, which, is, which, is, which is really cool. But teachers are working super hard. Um, 
and harder probably in terms of time than they have to, to work because on top of teaching the classes, there is a lot of emailing back and forth with individual students or small groups of students. There is a lot of meeting, like this sort of meeting with individual students or small groups of students um, outside of the regular class time. It, it's a really demanding way to try to teach. I'm really proud of our students, their engagement, their willingness to try. Um, and I also want to mention our technology integrators, um, uh, Ginger Raspiller, who holds the title of technology integrator, but her partner is absolutely Carolyn Young, who's our library and media specialist. Um, and they get a lot of report behind the scenes on the more technical aspect from Matthew Young, um, who's a high school technician who's doing great work behind the scenes. Um, we have support teams that are being led by Nate, our assistant principal, Nate Carpenter, who are reaching out to students um, who are struggling. Teachers are in contact with the support team so that we um, can do what we need to do to, um, to, to assist those students and parents who to figure out to do some problem solving and make sure that everybody is engaged as much as possible. I do want to mention our special education teachers as well and ed techs. Um, and I know this is true at all three buildings. They are, were, and Dell will say more about this. Um, they are working really hard because on top of trying to meet with all their students individually, they have a ton of paperwork documentation to do behind the scenes for essentially every conversation they have with a student or a parent. And I, and I will say I've come to appreciate the lighthearted moments of remote learning, and there have been some. Um, last week and this week, particularly the good morning videos that um, Ben Ben Raymond, who's a special ed teacher and coach, has issued, and then Mr. Lupian sort of did a bit of a spoof um, variation on that theme this week as well. I thought that was fun, and my understanding is there's going to be a student good morning submission coming out before the end of the week. That's what's in the rumor mill anyway. So um, I, I think I think um, we're trying to keep it serious but light um recognizing that it's an anxious and stressful time so anything we can do to sort of defuse some of that um is i think really helpful so that's the report from the high school that's great thank you for that jeff um and then we have the director of special services dell good evening everyone um in special education, uh, essentially, we are mirroring what's going on in each of, each of the schools. Special education staff are supporting students. Um, any student that has an active IEP was developed, uh, had a remote or distant learning plan developed for each one. It was individualized. Um, and it basically follows the, uh, the, the goals that they work on on a regular basis if we were in session. Um, as you can imagine, uh, some of the services that we provide in special education are tricky to provide over um, the format we're using right now. So we're doing our best. And uh, just to touch on Jeff's point, yes, there is quite a bit of documentation that is required um, in the sense that we, uh, we are working really hard to connect to our students. Um, and I just, I, I just do want to put a plug in for the staff. They're doing a wonderful job um, in the current circumstances of providing um, supports for students as they need them, trying to keep up with assignments that are going on the gen ed classrooms. Ed techs are working as well in the sense that they're reaching out and connecting with students and breaking down uh, uh, assignments so that they're meaningful for each student. Um, I'm very proud of the staff. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Kimberly had her hand raised after Jeff. So um, if, I'm not sure if this is for Dell or Jeff, but go ahead, Kimberly. Um, well, it actually, I just, um, I just wanted to just put out a, a shout out of appreciation for um, for all the hard work that all the teachers and administrators have done to make this work as smoothly as it's worked. Um, we were able to hit the ground um, running the first day that, um, that we had school after school was closed. Um, 
And I, I just think that um, was amazing and, uh, and amazing how smoothly it's been going. So thank you all so much. Um, and I had a question, which I think would be directed primarily to Troy and Jason about um, conferences. Is there any um, organized plan to, to tackle conferences or is that our teachers just kind of figuring that out as they go along? Jason, thank you. Okay, I'm unmuted. So um, you're talking about winter conferences or March conferences. March, so, yeah. So if you have a Palm Cove student and haven't had one, you, I would suggest reaching out to the teacher. We, we were partway through conferences and, and most teacher, teachers that I was aware of, they were completing them remotely. So we were right in the middle of them as school closed and they were doing them over the phone and doing them via Zoom. Um, so I would suggest starting with reaching out to the teacher. I'm not sure if maybe some did not complete them all, but we, we did, we talked about that and teachers were finishing them just remotely. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. I would say that's pretty much the same thing at the middle school. Like I believe some have finished and I would also, it may be 50, 50. Um, I think probably has been put on the back burner a little bit with the overwhelming feeling that they have right now. And the communication level in general has probably <laughs> increased at least between individual students and, and them. So um, that is something that we're going to talk about next after break to make sure the teachers are on it. I know it's late, but um, because we have some kind of discussions before I send out an email to parents and I'd like to send few, but have all the information I need. So um, that's kind of the goal for that. And that also, because we have a lot of questions coming up as far as placement, um, you know, math placements and how we're gonna do that because there's some steps we usually do that are kind of hard to do now. So really the, the next communication home will kind of talk about all those things. Thank you so much that answered my next question as well. So that about placement, so thank you. And if I could, Kim, uh, Kimberly, just, so I will, I will check in with all my staff and kind of get a read on if there's what percentage may have not finished. So thank you for that question. Oh, yeah, no, I, and I was just wondering j just generally how, how that had been handled as we missed the actual conference day that was scheduled. So thank you. Yes, thanks. Any other questions right now from the board? Okay, uh, next up, Kathy Stanker, the Director of Teaching and Learning. Hello, everyone. Nasser, did you just put your hand up? He's doing the oh, applause, okay. I think. Okay, all right. Um, so for my report tonight, I would like to present um, our remote learning plan, which is in your agenda as the continuity of learning program. So I need someone to share, give me the ability to share my screen. Oh. By making me a co-host. Let's see. How did you do that, Nasser? More. Chat. Make co-host. There we well, go. Uh, I have a question. Actually, I don't know why it's a, it's a clap. I know there's one a good hand mark and there's another uh, clap. I don't see in my chat uh, raising a hand for some reason or another. But I have a question for... Uh, Related to oh. Jason and uh, Jeff. Um, okay. This is in reference to uh, activities that or clubs that can be done online, um, such as chess club, for example. There may be other ones. And I know that there's high school students who volunteer and mentor to do reading for young kids, in the second grade and first grade. And if something like that or certain activities can be still uh, in place or not. I know that you guys have been doing a great, great job. And so you're doing the priorities academics and then we move on to the um, activities. Thank you. So I have to say that, that question has not even occurred to me and it's a great question. Um, I'm not sure about the chess club specifically. I do know that, um, that our 
Sorry, I'm blank. the ELO coordinator um, is working with some student volunteers who have volunteered to do some reading um, and to read if, if for classes or teachers or just parents who are interested in seeing high school teachers read, read books or read something like that. Nasser, I'm not aware whether there are, oh, I, so I do know that um, there are a couple of activities that I know that are happening. So, for example, I know that the theater director, Christy Marshall, is doing some virtual rehearsals of the play The Crucible. Um, that is happening. I know that Mr. Scarponi is working on a project with his jazz band. Um, I don't know what his timeline is for rolling out what he's doing. Um, I, those are the activities that I am aware of. Um, a lot of the activities that would be in the nature of competitive activities like math team, mock trial, science team, well, speech and debate, its season was basically over anyway. My guess is that I have not heard of anything happening in that realm. Almost all of those teams are advised by teacher advisors and I think they're hanging on by their fingertips just doing <laughs> doing the remote teaching that they're doing now, sir. But um, I, I am aware of theater and jazz band and I wouldn't be surprised, Chess Team, you're right, is something that could definitely happen. And I do know there's, a, there's a, an initiative um, to, do some, to do some reading and make that available for interested parents and teachers. Donna, you had something to add to that maybe? Yes, the last I talked to Jason Lund, he was, um, trying to start up the esports um team um to do from home so um i think that i think that is going on mm -hmm. elizabeth um i can say anecdotally that there are students who were part of clubs that are still kind of communicating and doing things although it might not be sort of in the official capacity with the advisor at this time. So I think students are still making connections and doing those sorts of things as, as we would expect them to do. Yeah, my own is suggesting um, that they are, if you make a list of the activities and share that with the uh, IT staff, uh, there may be some possibilities for them to meet, as Elizabeth say, one doesn't have to do a particular activity, but they could be for a meeting purpose. It's like a accounts like meetups uh, and other things like that as well. So it would be nice to keep kids active in addition to uh, we have been keeping them active academically. That's a great suggestion. I do know, actually, the other thing that occurs to me, I do know that there are some spring athletic coaches who have sent out suggestions for sort of personal, not group, but personal sort of fitness things related to the sport that uh, they are that they are missing this spring. So I know I know there are definitely coaches who are in touch with the members of their team as well. Okay, anything else? Um, Kathy, one second. Nasser, my apologies. I thought that was a clap. I didn't realize that you were looking to speak. So my apologies to you. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think we're ready to hear Kathy now. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, sorry, that took a second. Okay. Okay, can you all see it? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so the first thing I wanna say is that although I am presenting this tonight, um, you can think of me as the great compiler um, and that 90% of the work on this, if not higher, um, was done by the principals in conjunction with their assistant principals and leadership teams. And I, I think they've all been very gracious in commending the staff which is all true for their um, hard work and initiative and smarts, um, but um, the principals have 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 really gone above and beyond in order to put this together. And if you have children in the schools, a lot of this is already going to look familiar to you because of the very detailed guides that each of the principals sent to uh, to, to students and parents. So, 
So with that said, um, I am just going to point out um, a few things to you, knowing that you are going to be voting on this tonight. Um, there is a lovely introduction that was written by the superintendent um, that accompanies the strategic plan goals. I'm going to um, skip down to the remote learning goals um, and encourage you, though, to read the introduction at your leisure. Um, these are the three goals that are uh, true for all of the schools um, and have been since, um, since this grand experiment started. So the first is to maintain regular contact with students and their families. The second is to provide consistent, flexible instructional programming for students. I was glad to hear Ali mention the importance of flexibility. I think she was the first to say that. It's been very true. And the third is to support the health and well-being of students, families, and staff. And I think you heard those goals echoed in all three of the principal's reports. Um, as far as the delivery of instruction goes, um, in all three schools, we have teachers providing instruction Mondays through Thursdays and reserving Fridays for check-ins, advisory, optional activities, other forms of student support, et cetera. Um, that the instruction can occur um, in a variety of ways, either live as we're doing now through video conferencing or through pre-recorded videos um, or through uh, digital platforms and applications, um, depending on the particular lesson, depending on the content area, depending on the age of the students. Um, those are all decisions that are being made by the teachers. Um, and then finally, our teachers are continuing to provide accommodations for students who have 504 plans or IEPs, as Dell alluded to. Then the next two issues that are addressed in the plan are those of attendance and grading. Um, attendance is based on three factors, the interaction that the students are having with their teachers, um, whether they are completing their work, um, and if they're demonstrating engagement. So um, we're very much taking into account the fact that this is remote learning. It's not like just showing up for school or showing up for a particular class. And our hope is that students who are unable to participate will um, contact their teachers to make clear that they're, that they're ill and, and unable to partake. And then as far as grading, as all three principals indicated, um, there's, there are uh, discussions that are ongoing um, that really the, the emphasis is on providing feedback, timely and effective feedback, and then grades when, when appropriate, basically more grading at the high school than, than in the uh, other two schools. Um, students are expected to interact with their teachers and complete assignments, as I've already said. And again, we want students to get in touch with teachers if they um, need some additional support. Support And in all of the schedules, which we'll be getting to, um, there, there's, there's a lot of time set aside because, for that because this is just, just a very different animal than, um, than what we're used to. Then as far as instructional supports are concerned, again, um, so there are nine different types of supports that are, we're providing in addition to the support provided by the classroom teacher. And um, so just going through those, we have in, in number one, we have our, our intervention services and our interventionists are continuing to provide instruction and resources for the students with whom they've been working in all three schools. We have our school counselors available to provide social and emotional support. And in the case of the high school counselors to provide academic information. Um, our EL teacher is uh, meeting regularly with, um, with her students to provide instruction and resources. Um, and the same is true for our GT teacher who is providing instruction and resources for the students who've been identified for GT services. Our school nurses are available to answer medical questions. Our social workers are working with, with the students with whom they were working before this, before remote learning started. As um, Del mentioned, we've got our special educators working really, really hard to provide instruction and services in accordance with the, the, the IEP that's been modified for remote learning. We have, I think Jeff mentioned, we have support teams in all three schools that, that are reaching out to students who are um, less engaged and whom the teachers and administrators have concerns about um, to see what additional supports they might need, how we can help um, to keep the learning going. And then finally, as all of all three administrators, all three principals mentioned, we have fabulous technology integrators um, 
and uh, just just and not just the tech integrators. I mean, the entire tech staff has really risen to the occasion. Um, all of our school issued devices are have gone home, um, and then there's an email address for how if you were to experience an issue, you would you would get in touch with them. And then as far as custodial nutrition services are concerned, the schools are being sanitized on a daily basis. Um, access to the schools is subject to the approval of the, the, um, the school principals as well as the director of facilities and transportation. And then nutrition services, our nutrition services staff are preparing meals for any families who indicate that they need them. They sign up for the backpack program. Those meals are delivered once a week. Um, and we are accepting donations for people interested in doing so and the information is there. Then the next section of the plan um, just shows the schedules that are being followed in each of the three schools. So in, at Pond Cove, um, we're th we think in terms of um, time frames, so the amount of time that we would expect students to be engaged in learning. Um, and you'll notice that um, overall for students in kindergarten, first and second grade, the academic work time should not exceed 40 to 80 minutes. And then for students in grades uh, three and four, it should not exceed 90 to 120 minutes. And then the middle school, the fifth and sixth grade schedules um, are similar. Uh, just, um, the, the differences really are when the specific content areas meet. Um, and so they've set aside uh, 50 minutes um, for each content area twice a week. Um, and then Fridays, as I mentioned, are being used for, for catch up and also band sectionals. Um, the seventh and eighth graders are like the high school, following more of a traditional schedule in that it's not by content area, but it's, it's by periods. So your regular period one class now meets on Mondays and Wednesdays from nine to 9.50. And then you'll see that at the high school as well. So again, classes are meeting twice a week with Friday being used for, for office hours or student supports. And then finally, the last page of the plan are links to um, the district pandemic plan, which Donna was prescient. She saw this coming and got that pandemic plan going, thankfully, um, well in advance, I think, of other school districts. Um, and all of these plans, that plan and then all of the learning guides provide a lot more detailed information. Again, you've probably seen that before, but so we have the remote learning guides um, for each of the three schools linked here. And as these are our live links um, to Google Docs, so as those plants are updated, um, they will also be updated on this plan that you will hopefully approve tonight. So. I guess the last thing I would say is that um, having embraced remote learning uh, having put in as much work as, as has been put in, um, we are talking about the possibility of next year, rather than um, having to call school for bad weather or power outages, um, that there's a possibility we could put this plan into place, that the bones are there, um, and that we would not have to um, sacrifice learning just because we weren't able to gather in the schools. So questions, I think I saw that Kimberly had raised her hand. Go ahead, Kimberly, thank you. I, um, I was wondering how um, are, are we revising the curriculum at all for this year, I guess, for, for you know, are we, do we still have the same um, in targets for what we hope to accomplish with our students? Um, I know um, that probably our classroom time with our students is a little shorter now. I, I'm just wondering if if, um, if there have been adjustments made or if we're still trying to um, accomplish everything we set out to. So that's a great question. And I would say that those discussions are just starting. I mean, when, when this began, we thought we were going to be out for two weeks. And then we were going to be out for five weeks and now we know we're out until the end of the year. So um, after the April break, 
Um, the principals and I are going to be meeting with teachers with the grade level teams in the lower grades with teachers of the same courses in the upper grades to determine what, what, what are the realistic goals that we can set for students. We have to know what those end of year targets are because we're going to need to know, we've got to have something against which we can measure student performance so that we can remediate as necessary. Um, but I would say that, um, that there are sort of pockets of that understanding, but after the break, we're going to make that, we're going to make that concerted effort to determine that. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. Donna, is your hand raised? Yeah, there, there, it looks like there's somebody else's hand raised and with the splitting the screen, I'm having a hard time. So if anybody had a question. I can stop sharing time. my screen too, if, if people don't need to see anything specific. Uh, Heather, there's a question in the chat. I do not know if that's public or. or... Um, right. Um, I appreciate the question. Um, we'll share the question with the superintendent and get back to her as that um, we're trying to use this similar to create this Zoom meeting similar to a, um, a regular business meeting and we don't welcome public uh, questions and comments from the public at this time. So I do see the question. I will note it down and I will um, pass it on to the superintendent. Um, at this point, it's not open. We had the moment earlier um, to um, to have public comment. And um, it, please don't worry about it. We're all trying to figure this out. Just like we've been saying earlier, there's flexibility, there's a learning curve. It's with the students, it's with the teachers, it's with the school board, it's with everybody. So um, it, I would like to answer it, but I want us to try to follow protocol and policy. So we will um, get back to you uh, for the public who has asked that question. Um, I did have a few questions, but I want to see if other school board members had something to ask. No, uh, go ahead, Elizabeth. Um, I thank you, Kathy, for sharing this plan and thank you to everybody who put it together. Um, I would really hope that we're careful about talking about how to use it in the future, especially when we talk about power outages and um, online learning and um, snow days and that sort of thing. I think we probably wanna be really careful about um, remembering that, especially on a snow day when someone maybe left their iPad at school and, and you know the, the variety of device accessibility and internet accessibility that we probably wanna be careful because conversations like, you know, just like what you referred to are already out there bubbling in the public. So I, I just wanna caution and be careful about talking about that and planning for that. Um, I've been really careful to say that, you know, we are, we're, we are working on this plan for this pandemic right now. And yes, it, there's a possibility there, but you know, we don't have plans for that at this time. So I'm hopeful that we'll be careful. Thank you for that, Elizabeth. Um, that's a really great reminder. Uh, we're dealing with what we're dealing with right now. And that's what this exercise and this uh, plan is for. Um, I had just a question about the plan, Kathy. Um, and it, it was, I, how did it come about? I, I know that there were principals involved and there were various people coming together, but obviously I, I'm, I'm assuming that this is a brand new thing. Like there wasn't a model out there, like there are policy models that you can pull from and use examples from like, so I'm assuming this was created by scratch. Um, I'm wondering if other districts are doing it, if you've sort of conversed with other districts to see what their plans are, if they're making plans. If there's some sort of coordination if we're kind of doing this in a silo, uh, living document that will grow and expand um, with time and as we get to, to um, understand and know more about that. Um, and I'm wondering if, uh, similar to what Wynn Phillips had mentioned at the beginning in the public comment, if once we get through this and teachers are not and administrators are not so uh, in the thick of everything that's going on, and they have a little time to breathe and reflect if there's gonna be a task force or a group 
that can come back and revisit what things were like. And um, I'm hoping that that's in the plan, but I just want to double check that. And then I had one more question that maybe is um, for the principals a little bit, but this Friday day sounds like a really fantastic idea. It's like a catch up day. It's the opportunity to get off the regular schedule and make one on one contacts if you need it. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, how it's working. It, if it does, if it seems like it's useful, and uh, if it's um, how that's going, because I think it didn't start that way and then it became a unique aspect of the week. Kind of like three questions there. So I'll answer number one and number two, and then Great, defer to the you. principals for number three. So for number one, um, there's been a lot of um, coordination and communication. Um, Donna regularly meets with the Cumberland County Superintendents Association. I meet weekly with um, curriculum leaders around the state. Um, Jeff has mentioned meeting with area principals. So um, there, every district has a plan. People are being very generous about sharing their plans. Um, the, there, there, are temp, there are templates actually. I mean, I think we were pretty far along by the time some of the templates were developed. Um, but um, so yes, um, I, no one is operating in a vacuum right now. Um, and then your second question was, um, like a task force, like oh, a yes, revisiting. Absolutely. absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm looking at Donna and I'm sure once, once the school year is at an end, I think we would all benefit from the opportunity to debrief this experience. Um, and uh, Donna. so yes. Uh, Donna raised her hand, so I'm wondering if she wants to add to that. Yeah, so if, if you if you uh, look at the pandemic plan, um, it, mm -hmm. in the after part, it says that we will go back and review what's happened and um, okay. make make changes and and uh, refine things. So that applies to the um, the learning plan as well. So thank you for that clarification. Um, and then I, I'm wondering if any of the principals would like to just speak to the Friday day and your impression on how that's working. Jeff, thank you. Okay, so um, first of all, a little bit of context. I think um, though different schools have adopted different days um, than our Friday, um, there are actually quite a few schools who have gone who are doing something similar. I, there's a nearby school district who does something similar on Wednesday. There's a lot of schools who are doing something similar on Friday. Um, I don't know if it was anybody copying everybody else or everybody had the same idea and realized that we just need to take a breath um, and let the kids take a breath and catch up and that sort of thing. I do think in the circumstances of really trying to fly this plane, um, try to build the plane while we're flying it, um, it is incredibly valuable because um, it gives teachers an opportunity to talk to kids in their advisory groups, uh, which is the one meeting that happens um, uh, on Fridays that's scheduled, um, to hear from kids who aren't necessarily in their classes and hear then their perspectives on how it's going for them overall. Um, and so I think that's great feedback that probably ties into the question about that Kimberly asked about um, whether we're trying to do everything that we do in the regular curriculum. And, um, and Kathy's absolutely right. We haven't defined that in writing anywhere, but I will say that the consistent mess, we are not doing what we would normally do in, in, in school. Um, it, um, and my consistent message to teachers has been to dial it back, dial it back, dial it back. And I think some teachers have struggled with that, but I think overall teachers have gotten it. And I think the Friday check-in time is, is helpful for teachers to get that grounding um, listening to sort of student voice around that issue. I will also say it's, it's kind of fun to see um, there's sort of lighthearted moments and um, you know my group is I reached out to two of the juniors in my advisory group the other day and said what would you like to do um, two Fridays ago and they had this thing that I'd never heard of they said something is really big on TikTok um, which is creating full house intro videos 
Um, so I know my advisory group is, we've all done full house intro videos and one of the students I would have is to no idea how to do this myself is weaving these all together into a, into a, into an advisory group TikTok, and then then I think we're going to challenge the rest of the school to do something similar. So that's again sort of consistent with sort of just expressing the idea that we care about the kids beyond just um, what they're doing academically. And I'm sure it looks a little bit different in in each of the other two schools, but I bet there are similar benefits um, to that time. There are also a lot of meetings that take place with academic support meetings on those days as well. Um, yes. Just they don't operate by a fixed schedule. That's really what's different. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions at this point? I think Marcy, our business manager, is up. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you. I'm gonna do uh, my screen share right now. And I can everybody see the first graph? Yes. Okay, great, I, let me scroll it down here. So here we are, um, the end of March, we were at 72% of our budget spent and the normal spending pattern would have been 75%. And so graphically here are our budgeted articles and i'm also going to show the detail of this um, debt service we've paid our our debt right there so that just jumped up for us this month as was expected for the timing of our payments and um, i'm going to jump over to here so here we are with our budget articles this is the detail all the backup that goes into that graph and this is the actual document uh, with our um, official articles, our 11 articles, as you can see. And down at the bottom, this is where I usually put last year compared to um, this year. Wow. So as you can see, the actual rounding, 71.59% spent this year. Last year at this time was 71.88% spent at the same time. And as you go through each article, I love this document, the way it explains under each category what is in that area. So regular instruction at 71.62%, special education, 67.48% spin. We don't have the career and technical. We jump down here to other instruction that is consists of the athletics, the co-curricular, extended school year, 62.2%. 38%. Student and staff support all of our guidance expenses, our library, technology, improvement of instruction, professional development, that's 69.52%. System administration, this is our superintendent, business office, and school board, we're at 69.44. School administrations, article number seven, all the principals, 71.76% spent. Transportation and buses, 70.97%. Facilities maintenance, 76.75%. Our debt service, as we had pointed out, at 100%. And our school nutrition at 84.09%. And that one, um, we will expect to be 100% spent by the end of the year. I'm working with the school nutrition department right now to make sure that um, their expenses are absorbed in the budget that we have and the general fund for them in addition to the transfer that we have. Um, let's see. So are there any questions on this? These two things at this time. Uh, oh, and I, I see a hand. I see Jeff. Okay. No, we, we can't hear you though. That was from before. I forgot. Oh, to okay, look. good. Okay. I can't see the whole screen. So if anybody has a question, I guess just let me see I, if I can. See. I have a question. Uh, uh, you need to touch upon it later. Uh, and I'm sorry for asking such a bad question, such a bad times. Uh, but due to the uh, COVID-19, are we going to save any money in reference to transportation, utility bills, supplies, food? And I'm well, um, 
Let's see, where should I, Donna, where would you like me to start? Which category would you like me to start? Okay, I'll just jump in. Um, the school nutrition is actually going to cost um, more money at this time. However, we're getting great donations into the backpack program, which is so helpful. Um, the school nutrition has been running a little over budget, so that won't have any savings. Um, the facilities management costs, as you could see, are going to still cost us money. We're not gonna have savings there, but the substitute category will have some sa uh, savings in that area for sure. Donna, yes. I see Donna's hand. Also, um, there was just a waiver um, through the school nutrition program and we so we have applied back for that so we can get funding. They waived all of their restrictions and I think oh, that was one of the questions that um, was in the chat room, but um, oh, we, have, new. we have applied and um, been accepted back into that. So we will be um, eligible for funding through the school nutrition program. You remember that we dropped it for high school. So we're, we're back in now. So, um, so that's going to help us a lot. That's great. Thanks, Donna. That's good news. Yes. Yeah, so now there's pretty much, um, any savings that we'll see will definitely come, the, the largest amount will come for the substitute line item, just because of a, our facilities costs, we're already running us a lot over budget. So it'll hopefully keep us within a range that will be good going forward with um, needs for carryover and that sort of thing. Any other questions? And I'll try to scroll through here. Okay. Um, I wanted to also mention, um, and I don't need to screen share, do I anymore, Donna? Is there anything else that you guys wanted to see today at that point? No. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk about, Donna wanted me to touch on the stimulus money that is um, out there now. There's news that we've received from the CARES Act related mm -hmm. to COVID-19. And for the um, every week, business managers are met with the state finance team and the, they're giving us information every week to keep us updated and we can ask questions about everything that comes up NASA about savings or, or anything other extra expenses and one of the things they brought up this last Monday was that from the CARES Act we will expect some stimulus money and the formula will mirror our Title I funding and the preliminary number that we've received for Title I for Cape Elizabeth so far for the new year is 31,451. The funding formula for the stimulus money will be 80% of our normal Title I funding. So we could expect approximately $25,161. We, we will apply for it, we will receive it, and we have a 12 month period to spend it and the flexibility will be um, there a lot more compared to our normal Title I spending restrictions. Um, so, and it will look just like our normal federal funding that we receive for Title I monies. So that was um, something that we've learned about this week. And they have not, re they have not finalized or released the final ED-279 information. That was another thing that they touched on in this past meeting. And I know Donna has also received this information in the superintendent's meetings. So that was a um, critical thing. So we we're waiting to receive our final notification. And I think it might be a little while, just to, um, from the indication that we are given. Yes, Elizabeth. I hate to ask this, but is there a possibility of curtailment? let Donna respond. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so they are, they haven't actually said the word, but they're advising us to be very careful um, with our finances, um, not to hire any new positions, uh, not to move forward with the hiring, um, to replace positions that are currently in the budget, but they're, um, they are warning us not to uh, move forward with, with filling new positions. Um, because most likely, they haven't said the word curtailment, but that's um, most likely coming down the line. Exactly. That was the word they've given us to Elizabeth. They said to be very conservative going into our process. Cautious and conservative. Yes, Don. In addition, um, 
thinking about um, the referendum that where the voters approve on the budget, approve the budget, um, that is kind of up in the air about when that will happen. The less I, I heard something about July, maybe. Um, so um, until we can get a budget passed, we have to operate in the old budget, in the budget for this year. Uh, so that's another thing that we're looking at. So it's going to be a very, very challenging uh, year for funds. Heather, was there anything else you'd like me to talk about? No, thank you for all that. Um, okay, yeah. so I'm next. Do you want me? <laughs> Go <laughs> ahead, Donna. Any other questions for Marcy? I'm just sort of letting things sink in a little bit, right? This is, um, you know, I, I think the comment has been made in several areas in different ways, but unprecedented times, right? I mean, here we are talking about the date of the referendum moving and, um, you know, the, the ED 279 perhaps being curtailed. I mean, these are, these are big conversations and, uh, you know, being given one message six weeks ago and having to be told or being told now to maybe think more conservatively. So I'm just sort of letting things sink in and just hearing what you have to say. So thank you for sharing all that, both of you. Donna, take it away. So I would just like to thank all of the amazing teachers that we have for doing, doing what they're doing. Um, every once in a while, uh, an email from a parent will filter through that will describe something that's going on um, with one of the teachers today. Um, I, I received one about um, Brie, Brie Gallagher at Pond Cove and um, how much what she's doing with the students means to this particular parent student. And uh, we got some um, amazing um, things that uh, have happened from Caitlin Ramsey's music class and, and it, it just goes on and on. There's just some amazing things. Our, our teachers are, are just working so hard and, and they're doing, while they're exhausted, um, they're doing some amazing things for our kids, some really creative, just amazing things. So I just, I would like to really publicly thank them. And then the administrative team has been absolutely amazing as well. Uh, we have been meeting the full administrating administrative team, which includes um, Perry, uh, Peter Esposito, and Noel. Uh, we've been meeting twice a week, um, Tuesdays and Thursday mornings for, for two hours, good, uh, intense two hours. There are so many things to talk about. Um, they are really keeping the teachers going, keeping the kids going, and uh, we are just, um, so fortunate to have such an amazing staff and amazing administrators. Um, I include Jeff Thorak in there who's been meeting with us as well. Um, so we have been having discussions about um, every, every little detail that we've had to change and, and rethink and revise as we've gone through this. Uh, first thinking that it was going to be two weeks, then thinking it was going to be five weeks, now thinking that it's um, going to be the, to the end of the year. So um, I just really want to thank everybody for their support and their just amazing, exhaustive work that they've been doing. Uh, we have moved our, our um, conversations and administrative team on to the end of the year. So I'm going to talk more about that in, in a minute. Um, on March 12th, uh, Marcy, Perry, Heather, Kimberly, and I interviewed two architectural firms uh, that supplied applications in response to our advertisement uh, for a request for qualifications. Um, and this is um, uh, in reference to our school revolving renovation project. So while all of the um, education stuff is going on, the, the, other, um, the other things are going on in the background. Uh, so we interviewed, we had two applications, two submissions of um, qualifications. And so we interviewed both of the uh, architectural teams and um, the support for Colby Company, and you'll be um, considering uh, them for approval um, as we move through the agenda. Uh, the, the support was unanimous. Um, 
with everybody on the team uh, based on their experience with our district, our knowledge, their knowledge of the projects, their plan for the completion of the projects, and their suggestions about securing contractors. So we had an amazing discussion and um, again it was the recommendation was unanimous. So the committee recommends that the project be awarded to Colby Company. Uh, then another thing that you're going to be looking at in a bit is uh, a pro the proposal that came forward that we changed the calendar to include Friday, April 17th, which is this Friday, as a regular school day. Normally it would be considered a vacation day, um, but in order to complete the week, you've heard all of the, the things that go on on Fridays. Fridays are, um, while it may not be new academic instruction, there's a lot that goes on. So. Um, in order to really complete this week with the, with the Friday before we send kids off um, onto um, a vacation for a week, um, uh, there, there was a proposal to move the last day um, uh, of school then. Uh, uh, the half day for K-12 students, it would be Thursday, June 18th. And the last half day for high school teachers would be Friday, June 19th. So uh, Wynn helped with, um, or actually he did, uh, the survey for, uh, to teachers. And 97% um, um, of those were in favor of um, counting Friday as a school day. And then on Monday, we administered a survey to parents and students. And boy, this is a great time to do a survey. We had 1,183 responses, and there were uh, 1,011 uh, responses answered that they were in favor of the calendar change to count Friday as a school day and 172 indicated that they were not in favor. So I am recommending uh, the change of April 17th from a vacation day to a school day. Um, we have started discussion regarding the end of the school year. Um, we, at the end of last week, uh, the decision was made um, to continue remote learning. So these discussions are just starting, but we're talking and taking all kinds of things into consideration. There are many things that we need to, to think about. Uh, remediation times, the 183 days in the teacher contract, the collection of student devices. I can't remember how many hundreds of devices Noel said we have out there, but it's pretty incredible. And materials, so trying to collect them all back before uh, we send our students off for the summer. Uh, the status at the end of the year of the stay home mandate. So there, there are many things to, um, to think about and to keep um, to keep our eyes on. Um, so if there are any recommended changes, we will bring them to the board um, at the May school board business meeting for review and consideration. Uh, I just want everybody to know that we are talking about it. Um, we've just started the conversation. Um, so uh, we will, that will continue to be one of the major topics of our administrative team meetings as we proceed. Any questions? Right. Heather, I think you're muted. Uh, I just want to reiterate, there's been a lot of uh, applause for the teachers, which is very warranted for the students and for the parents, everybody being flexible and adapting. But I also want to uh, make it public and thank all the administrators and um, to Donna. I've had several conversations over the weeks and I am just blown away with all the details that um, have to shift based on uh, the pandemic and school, the actual buildings not being open and that there are lots of other um, tasks and um, things that need to still happen and now all of those things are happening in a different way and they all have to be figured out and so um, little things like enrollment um, as an example that we talked about the other day um, so thank you for all that you were doing um, to all every single one of you is doing from the teachers, the students, the parents, the administrators, the ed techs, 
um, the technology department, the nurses, um, Brie Gallagher, um, all the creative ways. Um, and if, a lot of them have been mentioned today, but um, thank you to everyone. So, any other questions or comments? I am not seeing any. So that leads us into new business. Um, and just a reminder to school board members, uh, we actually have to say our vote, yay or nay, and I'll go through and do like a little roll call. Uh, but item 7A, can I have a motion? I move that we consider to approve Thomas McNeely for the high school math teacher position for SY 2020-2021. Could I have a second, please? Second. Thank you, Laura. You're welcome. <laughs> Is there any discussion? Is this a position that's filling a retirement position in the high school, Donna? It is. Okay, so it's not a new position being created. No. It's a filling of one that already exists. Yes, okay. exactly. Thank Better you very much. That. Any other any other questions or comments? Computers being a little glitchy. Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and vote. Heather Altenberg, yay. Kimberly Carr, yay. Yay. Uh, Philip Saucier, yay. Uh, Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser Shear. Yay. Uh, Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Totally frozen. Uh, Laura, my computer totally froze. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Thank you to the school board members. Uh, item 7B, new business item. Can I have a motion? I move we approve the calendar change proposal for April 17th, 2020. And a second. second. And any discussion? Great. Um, I think this is pretty well explained already through Donna's summary as the superintendent. Uh, Heather Altenberg, yay. Kimberly Carr? Yay. Phil Saucier? Yay. Yay. Hear you, it was glitchy. So if you could repeat. Elizabeth? Yay. Thank you. Uh, Nasser Shear? Yay. Thank you. Hope Straw? Yay. And Laura Danino? Yay. Thank you. Uh, item 7C, can I have a motion, please? So I. I'm looking at the ag agenda that I have online, but it doesn't quite match up with what was just read. So is 7C the um, Colby company? 7C is about the Colby company. Consideration to approve the Colby company as the architect for the revolving renovation fund project. Okay. Do you need a motion on that? I, can, I, can I would it. love an motion, please. <laughs> All right. I move that we consider to approve the Colby company as the architect for the revolving renovation fund project. Thank you. Do we have a second? Okay, thank you. Was that Nasser? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think that as well was explained. Um, and I'm really looking forward to having Colby in here doing some work for us. They've proven over and over again to be passionate about Cape Elizabeth, care about this district, and um, I'm really excited that they were awarded the work. Um, so Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Thank you. Um, Phil Saucier. 
Yay. Uh, Elizabeth Seyfries. Yay. Thank you. Nasser Shear. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. <laughs> Item 7D. I move we approve the continuity of learning program. And a second. Second. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Any further discussion on that document? I would just like to thank everybody who, in the midst of everything else that was going on, trying to um, help teachers get into this remote learning, um, help students get involved, that we were able to pull this together. And um, I would like to reiterate a thank you to Donna for having the forethought for that pandemic plan that helped us just move through all of this, it seems like, with relative ease, not lack of work, I want to be clear, but with relative ease, you make it look easy. Uh, so a vote, uh, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr? Yay. Um, Phil Saucier? Yay. Elizabeth Seyfries? Yay. Nasser Shear? Yay. Hope Straw? Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Thank you. And then we have item 7E. I move I we motion. approve the FY21 school budget. And do I have a second? Second. Yes, I heard two. I'm going to put Phil's name down. Um, any discussion? So question that is probably too late and the question that our remarks start when raised and I guess it cannot be entertained at such times. Can you, can you restate that question? I'm sorry, I didn't yes. follow you. So we had raised some questions about the achievement centers and lack of support over there. I presume the current budget does not include that. Do we want to discuss that? I we think can that absolutely. The, the staffing of the achievement center is really up to um, Principal Shed, and so um, that's we can't say as, as board members how it all shakes down, but it sounds like that it might not be fully staffed for next year. Um, I'm not answering as the, an expert, just understanding that we as the school board don't, you know, make those staffing decisions. And given that we may be facing a curtailment down the road, um, that might not even be the worst of our problems. I'd like to know, I know uh, there are legitimate reasons and I agree there were some other emails were sent out about the fact that we, most students are studying home and not having the writing and reading skills. So are there any chances aside from, oh this is Donna's question, aside that there will be any funds available to even hire temporary or maybe adult volunteers uh, and for the achievement centers? Well, if we're talking adult volunteers, I don't think that would... Um, like retired teachers, so... Yeah, uh, if they're volunteers, then they, we probably wouldn't be paying them, so that would certainly be a, a possibility. Um, we would have to get very creative, I think, and, and work with Jeff on that about um, providing support for students. Um, students also have, um, there is the um, advisory period where I believe that they can go, and Jeff, I think this is right, they um, can go and seek support from teachers at that point as well. 
Yeah, that's, yeah, that the achievement period, four days a week is a 30 minute block in the middle of the day where kids, kids is another opportunity to do writing conferences. I'm not gonna suggest it's the same as what's in the Achievement Center, but it is there. Um, and it's an important resource um, that's very heavily utilized by kids. Okay, any other comments? I'd like to just make a comment of the overall of the budget process and to just say thank you to our administrators for working so tirelessly to present a budget to the board that upholds our district values and our district goals. Um, I know a lot of the decisions that you had to make um, at this budget that we landed on weren't easy ones. Um, so I appreciate it and thanks for working together so well. Thanks. Yes, Bill. Yeah, and um, echoing what Laura said um, about the teachers and the administrators, but I also want to just say as the first time through this to thank Elizabeth. It was a, I thought it was a really nice process um, and clear and concise throughout. Um, uh, as well as Donna. So I, I followed the process as a citizen last year and was impressed and it was it was nice to see it um, sitting on the other side of the table this time. So thank you to everyone who was involved. I thought it was a good, very good process and thoughtful. And Marsha too, sorry. I wanna say, Mar Mar I, 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 Marsha was very helpful with everything and I, and I uh, sorry I neglected to mention you, your name, but the materials you presented were excellent. So I really appreciate that. Well, Phil, if you need Marsha for me, then I will just thank her alone, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the process was awesome, was great. Uh, every year we are making an improvement and uh, there, there's a lot of information. Yes, Pat does go off to Marsha because she is new. And uh, <laughs> she had to adopt a lot to, to Donna, to us as well. And uh, she was very quick in coming back with the options as well. And I think um, because of the pandemic and also there weren't many audience and uh, for that reason, a lot of information came toward the end uh, about certain staffing and about the situation the wind, wind has raised. I just wish that those things were uh, discussed, uh, brought out to us a little bit earlier. But despite that, uh, considering the times that we are in, uh, I think we have put the best budget out there, and let's uh, let's see what how we we can go forward from this. Thanks for everybody to doing a great work, including Elizabeth. Thank you for that, Nasa. Go ahead, Kimberly. You had something. Your hand was raised. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I just um, I I think. Um, we built on our successes from last year. I think this was a really positive budget um, process. It was um, it was thoughtful and clear and deliberate, um, well communicated. Um, I think uh, the administrators all um, worked really hard um, as they do each year, but really just you know analyzing everything that we have in the budget and um, and holding it up to see um, you know is everything doing the best that that it can achieve dollar wise um and per our students benefiting them the best it can um and uh, i recognize that takes a tremendous amount of time and uh, conversations and is not always an easy process but i appreciate you doing it um and i uh, appreciate the you know a lot of time that goes into this the whole way around school board members um, administrators, everyone. So thank you all. I think uh, this is a budget that is sensitive to the taxpayers, which I appreciate and, uh, and holds up um, to support our students well. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Hope you have your hand raised. Yep. Um, so I, I kind of feel like there's two, um, you know, this is a, a comment and a discussion point, I think. So there's sort of two different worlds. I think there's the pre-March 13th world, 
and then there's today and there's whatever might be happening in the future that we can't predict. And I think um, just in terms of this budget, I think if we say, you know, the process was, I think the best process I've witnessed as um, my time on the board, I think Elizabeth, you did a fantastic job and Marsha, the, the documentation was excellent and I appreciate all the hard work that went into this. And I think what's, I don't want to. I don't want to get negative, but we did. It was such a great job, and I think it's 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 the best we could do. It was it's 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 what we're going to put forward at this point. Um, but I think starting. Um, what's funny is Jeff said we've been doing this for five five weeks. I can't believe we've been doing this for five weeks because it feels like a week, and and so much has changed, and we don't we don't really know what it's going to look like in another month or two. But. Um, I just wanted to raise the comment um, to sort of touch upon Wynn's comment. I think there were things, there were there were little tweaks and, and changes that existed that may have had one impact in the in a normal scenario, and they're going to have a very different impact in the new world. So there's the post March 13th world and the the world where we have to address what what will things look like when the students come back in the fall. And so my question is sort of I, I wanted to see if we can sort of I personally don't really know like what what happens when if things look tremendously different like let's just say uh, best case scenario we pass the budget and we're going in with the with the, with what we have like how do we address those the, that thing how agile can we be like, is there room for changing things as needed um, and then I, you know I don't even want to bring up the worst case scenario so. <laughs> What happens, you know, how do we address those things? I mean, and, and what do we do, where do we find that pocket change in the couch cushions to help with those issues? Donna? Go ahead, Donna. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I think we just have to be um, very watchful and very careful about moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, really, um, keep our ears open to what's going on up in Augusta. And um, that's really the best we can do. We have to be very conservative during these times and really um, we're gonna have to reprioritize um, the positions that we fill first. Um, and uh, I don't know, <laughs> just be as careful as we can. Um, I've, I've been through a curtailment before and we, we made it. Um, but we were very careful and um, very, very watchful. And I think that's, that's how we have to be going into this. I think if we start really um, being careful at this point and thinking about the future, um, thinking that that's coming, um, we'll be okay. Thank you. So I just, I mean, I, I didn't, I don't want to um, end on a, on a negative note. I do, I do support the budget as, as put together and I greatly appreciate everyone's work um, that went into presenting it. It's frozen. Okay. Now you're back. Uh, can I just say one quick thing, Elizabeth? Um, I just want to respond to hope that um, I, these are hard times um, on so many levels. And in many ways, I feel like we don't know yet how hard they are until we're through it and on the other side. Um, and I don't believe you're being negative. I think you're trying to see reality and trying to grapple with it. And, and we're all trying to understand it. So um, I just want to give you that little piece from me that I don't see that as negative. I think it is responsible. So thank you for those thoughts and those words. Um, Elizabeth, you wanted to speak. Yes, please. Um, so I, I too wanted to have a, a little bit of a discussion on the same line as what Hope brought up along with, you know, my sort of prepared support for the budget as presented tonight. Um, one thing I think that the board probably needs to remember is that we are, we are approving a number and while we have seen what the superintendent has approved for the use of all those, you know, dollars, um, we can imagine that if 
there was a situation where there was a curtailment or different things going on that um, the superintendent would come back to the board and I would imagine that even though it would be more work for us that there would be um, a discussion around a redistribution um, and you know so there would be an, I would imagine an opportunity to give guidance to the superintendent um, should we face a situation where we have to look at you know projects versus you know people that sort of thing I think that I agree hope we're going to we're going to need remediation and we're going to you know things are going to look different so um, just a reminder we approve that number and we have a sense of what they're going to do with the money but should there be changes I think you know we need to be you know have that flexibility as, a, as we go down this road and understand that I'm sure the superintendent would have conversations with us. It's my, um, it's my, not just my wish, it's, it's my feeling and my belief in that relationship that we've built, built with our superintendent. Um, but tonight, I do want to talk a little bit about um, this budget season and the budget that we are presenting. Um, I thank uh, our new business manager, Marcy Weeks. It has been an absolute pleasure to work with you. Um, I feel like you have been incredibly responsive to everybody involved and presented us uh, factual, useful, and um, timely information. And um, the entire board appreciates that so much. I thank Donna. It, working with you as a superintendent on the budget is a dream. It's, we have great communication and um, it's, it's very easy to do. I thank all board members. This is the sort of the meat of our work um, outside policy. And um, it's a long haul starting back in January and here we are adopting a budget. So it's a big deal. And thank you to everybody for your thought and participation. I thank the administrative team. It is so wonderful to see everybody uh, working together and viewing every student as his or her own student, not, oh, you're an elementary student or you're a high school student. Um, it really feels like there's a unified front here in Cape Elizabeth that the administrators um, work together as a team and really brought this budget to the superintendent as a team and it's it's a wonderful feeling so i thank you for your cooperation your participation and your hard work in getting to us where we are now understanding that we aren't as far as we might like to be but we are still able to maintain our goals and so i just want to touch on you know, did we, with this budget, maintain and improve the high quality of education for every student? I believe that we did. I believe that we are working toward that goal with this budget. Number two, was there careful examination of line items and consideration of the success and effectiveness of expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget? Absolutely. Uh, one thing that really stands out to me is that um, Donna and the administrative team didn't just roll every program and every position over and assume that everything's working just fine and we just keep adding and adding. I think there was a critical eye taken across all programming and all staffing to try to figure out how can we do things better, um, what do we need to add, what were some enrollment challenges that we need to make up for and what do we need to expect for next year. So I absolutely believe that there was careful consideration of expenditures and we are doing the absolute best we can to provide a fiscally responsible budget. Goal three was to support the 2020 through 2025 strategic plan goals. And I absolutely believe that you can see in our budget that we are um, still supporting and hoping to expand the health and well being of our schools. We are supporting the addition of a guidance counselor at Pond Cove, and we are continuing to support social workers and um, guidance staff at all our schools. Uh, last year, there were, you know, there was an addition of a social worker at the middle school, 
there's been um, great evidence of success of that. And um, I'm glad that we're able to keep supporting that at the middle school and um, throughout our school department. Um, global competency was another strategic plan goal that I believe this budget, I, I don't have examples for every goal, but I did pull some out. Uh, multiple pathways and definitions of the success. I believe we've had a lot of discussion about that in particular around the extended learning opportunities programming and the board and the administrators have continued to um, talk about how important that is. The community, students and teachers have um, affirmed us in our belief that this is important. We've heard from many people. Um, safe, sustainable and effective facilities while this budget does not include anything as far as um, discussion around um, uh, bonding or projects because the building committee at this time is prudently on hold. Um, thanks to Donna and Marcy, we have the um, projects from the revolving renovations fund and um, we do have, you know, maintenance and upkeep projects in this budget. And then environmental responsibility, I believe, all of our projects, there's always an eye toward that in our budget as well. So, um, and then our final goal for, our, for this budget year was clear and continual communication throughout the budget process. Um, for this, I need to thank Donna primarily. I think that she has done an outstanding job with her um, communication and um, recaps after every single budget meeting. Um, the, I know that the board, the board chair, as well as myself, we have tried to, to utilize every um, communication channel we can think of to communicate around this budget and make sure that people understand and know what's going on. Um, I think that the challenges around not being able to meet um, at the library or in town hall have been met and met well. Uh, we're, we're all sitting here, we're participating, and I've seen um, various people pop in and pop out on Zoom. And while it's not a perfect platform, I believe that, you know, we are still offering that opportunity for um, communication and participation. So um, as, as I hold our budget up to these goals, I wholeheartedly support it and, and thank everybody for its work on it. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I too would like to thank the various participants that have put in so much time and dedication to creating a very smooth, um, uh, smooth budget process. Uh, Donna and Marcy, Elizabeth, your leadership in this as the finance director or finance chair has been um, outstanding. Um, all the board members for your thoughtful questions and participation um, has been um, very beneficial. All the administrators, the time that you put in coming in at night and sharing and the collaboration that I hear um, and have witnessed um, your ability to, um, you know, not get stuck in your own school or your own department and be willing to see the district as a whole is, uh, I think, a very strong way to move forward as a district. Um, I do want to thank um, those who have listened and followed along, paid attention to throughout the process. I will never know how many people they are. They're, you know, in their homes or they're watching the video later. Um, I do know that uh, town council member um, Sammy Garvin has been at uh, many, if not most, of the meetings, and I appreciate that. I think that collaboration that has been building over the past few years um, is making the communication between the town council and the school board better. So um, um, I think this has been a unique year. It, it has been a unique year. I don't think we all know that it has with the pandemic. And I just wanna point out that um, the budget process moved along at pretty much the same pace that it always has and always does. We had a schedule and we pretty much kept to it. We had to change modalities and come to Zoom. Um, but I think the, the, the budget work behind the scenes with the administrators, um, though it's always fluid, I felt like it was a lot more fluid 
this year because we had the big interruption of remote learning. And so some of the information was coming at us uh, in um, a bit incomplete. Uh, and, um, you know, right up until last week, things were constantly shifting in a way that I felt like was was more so than in years past. And so, uh, in my opinion, that made this year a little bit different and um, a unique experience. So it called for this process well to be flexible as we worked through things and changed our thinking pattern a little bit and, and came up with um, ways to make the budget uh, the one that we're landing with right now. And my example is that, you know, there was the idea floating around that the ELO coordinator position was, it was out there for a while as a 0.5 position. And then it became thought through with time, like that's not enough, let's move it up to a full-time position. And I feel like those kind of discussions weren't happening this late in the game to the degree that they have been happening this year. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I also want to acknowledge that these are really hard choices um, that have to be made. And um, I appreciate, I mentioned earlier, all the giving and um, collaboration that happened, willingness to back off of initial asks and letting another department step in. Um, and I know that we're doing the best we can trying to be fiscally responsible. Um, I think one of the things that's become even more clear to me during this year's budget process is uh, reminding myself, Elizabeth alluded to this a moment ago, our job as a board is to not micromanage, is not to make staffing choices, is to hear and what's present and come up with a number based on what we hear with the presentations coming. And it's, it's not my job to choose where that money goes necessarily and, and who gets staffed. Those are, those are in the principles. And I know, I believe they're trying to make the best choices that they can. Um, there are some, some hard situations. I have grappled with um, the Achievement Center um, and I have had a really hard time sitting with that conversation. I am hopeful um, initially, it sounded like there was no possibility to have English or math teachers in that in that um, in that position to support the achievement center. I fully acknowledge and hear that students can't do the same job. And it, as conversation continues, I, I hear more about why that's true. Um, but I am feeling hopeful that some teachers may be able to go in for one or two or maybe three periods. It may not be ideal. Um, I know this is a, a very unique and special um, aspect of our school that is incredibly beneficial. Um, and this is, um, this is an unfortunate situation uh, that I hope within a year or two, we will be back to, to full staffing there. Um, that, it, that would be a goal, a hope. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to finish by saying that um, these, some of these choices and some of what we hear, it, it's not easy, um, but we don't have pie in the sky. We, we, we can't say yes to everything. Um, and um, I think we're trying to do the best we can. So it's with that that I will be supporting this budget, um, especially with the comments that have been coming about, up about the potential curtailments um, and that things may shift even more once um, the budget is budget is voted on. Um, we have to be very fiscally responsible right now. So um, with that, if there's no other comments, I'm gonna look around and see if any board member has another comment to make. I just have one question about, okay, I might be like completely out of the loop, but, I'm trying to catch myself up about the AC. Does that mean we're, we'll only be staffing it part time? Like, will we have, I guess I'm just kind of confused by it. Could someone just explain it, <laughs> please? Thank you. Thanks, Piper. Um, I'm going to, Jeff? Jeff? Yes. Would you be willing to respond? I mean, I, I can do as well as I can do. Um, so there's, right. some, there's some unknowns in terms of the course tallies. Um, 
we still have a few students to hear from and there's some shifting that's happening right now literally around this time in the next week or two um, that are generated by course appeals and that sort of thing my hope is i mean my, my hope is that we can we can have at least a teacher in there for a couple of periods i'm a little more hopeful that that might be the case in English than in math. Um, I think math is going to be really hard. Um, it is a really hard trade-off um, for, for me to put on the table. Um, but given, given the priorities, given our mission statement and the reality of ELO and that sort of thing, that's, that's where we are. Um, I, I wish I was smart enough to come up with a different solution, but I honestly don't see it um, consistent with um, the, the board's strategic plan and the school's mission statement um, and those other sorts of things that sort of drive these dis discussions or th these thinking, this thinking. I, I thought I was done and then I'm not done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just, um, I, I didn't know where this discussion would um, be appropriate, but since Piper brought it up, I'm going to dovetail off her. And it's really sort of pointed towards Jeff, which is if enrollment projections are different, which we have learned they can, <laughs> enrollment can turn out differently than we thought. If enrollment projections happen to be somewhat uh, lower, um, is, is there an opportunity to bring staffing levels back up in the um, Achievement Center? And um, I've wondered, has it always been fully staffed? Is it fully staffed now? That sort of thing. So this year it's fully staffed in, with English, English teachers. So there's an English teacher there every period. Um, this year it's only uh, staff four out of the eight periods by math. Um, every year it's a little bit different. Um, it really depends what the uh, what the needs are in terms of teaching classes. If our are you suggest if our enrollment is lower than what's projected, was that your question? Then then it certainly would be possible. Um, I think um, I don't think there's anybody in the school who's more committed than I am to the achievement center. Um, I've been around long enough that was my signature on the initial CEF grant many years ago to, that got this the Achievement Center off the ground. Um, there's more, no more important thing than that we teach in the high school than writing. Um, um, and I'm confident that, and I, and, I, and I can't debate with Wynn that what students can do uh, with writing conferences is not the same as what teachers can do. But if there's a way uh, to get, teacher presence in the achievement center either math or english whether because of enrollment projections or the course tallies break a certain way and we can do it without increasing class sizes believe me i will we we will work together to make that happen uh because the goals are the same um it's just that there's a couple of important priorities that are in conflict this year that um are making it really challenging this year I appreciate your clarification. Thank you. Yeah, and I can just speak to a little bit. I, don't, I know this isn't something we'll be able to fix now, but just going forward, I think that the Achievement Center is something that's extremely unique to Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, and I can speak to the Achievement Center, I feel like the most because I'm always in there. Um, but just that the math section of it as well, I think is so vital because like I have to wait in line to speak to teachers just because they're being utilized so much. So I think it's definitely a discussion that has to be ongoing um, into next year um, in ways to make it work because I think that people can get creative. I won't be here, but just for the students to come after me, I think that the Achievement Center and having teachers there is a really huge part of our school. So I don't think we should not that we're neglecting it or anything. I understand it's a really tough decision, but yeah. Thank you, Piper. Okay. I'm not seeing any more hands raised or comments. So I'd like to vote. Um, Heather Altenberg, yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. 
Elizabeth Seyfried. Yay. Nasser Shear. Yay. Thank you. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Uh, next, we have consideration to approve policy second reading ACAA. Can I have a motion, please? I move that we consider to approve poli policy second reading ACAA. And a second. <clears throat> second. Second. Okay. Uh, discussion. Hope, would you be willing to speak, please? Sure. So um, I don't know if we have the ability to look at it um, to share what we have, but as you may recall, uh, last month we brought the policy to the board for a first reading with the inclusion of the um, confidential employees definition. And what we did there was we included an acknowledgement that the board recognizes um, license School psych licensed psychologists and so clinical so licensed clinical social workers, and um, for the most part, I think the the definition and the the mention we included, um, which then also includes an exception where it's clearly stated that these employees have a comf may have a confidential relationship, um, which may um, is is kept intact unless they have to comply you know, reveal information to comply with the state mandatory reporting obligations for um, child abuse or child sexual abuse. So what happened in the interim is um, we held a policy meeting at the end of March and it was brought to our attention that there was additional concern around the school nurses. Uh, so different employees who don't fall into those two categories of licensed psychologists and licensed cl clinical social workers, so school nurses, school counselors uh, who are certified but not um, clinical social workers. So at the policy meeting, and this is kind of a, a unique situation, so I, I kind of, um, I'm not sure, you know, I, I think I know how we proceed, but what happened was at the meeting we had a discussion where the committee had determined we, we want to include these, these people to the extent we can because I think there is a sense that school nurses um, uh, and school counselors are individuals that might be trusted um, and might find themselves in situations where they want to be that ear for a student. Um, uh, and we were hesitant uh, at the time to just say, yeah, let's do it, because they didn't have that licensed, the state licensed confidentiality requirement that needed to sort of be protected in order to allow them to abide by their, their professional license and at the same time um, do what the school needs them to do when there's an exception. So uh, we, we asked Kathy to um, take this concept and I, um, you know, we said, unless this is, unless this is a catastrophic error, uh, we want to try to include these people. Um, <laughs> Can we get some advice from council? And the council's response was, this is a catastrophic error. <laughs> so I, we're now in a situation where um, we don't have something. I, I, can't, I can't say this is what the policy committee asked to present. Um, we wanted something different. And I don't think we can really um, say this is ready for a vote right now. Um, I, uh, Elizabeth, I'm not sure if you were there for the whole discussion. If you have other comments or color you want to add. No, come on. <laughs> you represented it well. <laughs> no more comments. Um, so uh, that being said, I mean, I know um, I, I, you know, I work with um, kind of outside counsel all the time um, and I sort of always listen with a grain of salt. They have their, their, they have what they say, you take it, you interpret it and you make a decision based on that. Um, but I don't want to make that um, without having it discussed carefully with, with the full policy committee. I don't want to make, you know, make any decisions like that. And unfortunately, we're going to come back again next month with, uh, with ACAA. So are you so, suggesting that I'm we gonna, table it for tonight, Hope? 
Yes. So we're not vote. I would like to not vote on this. Okay. I think that sounds prudent and responsible. So to go back to the committee and, and be able to have that conversation and follow through. So is there is that good enough, Donna, just to say we're tabling it? Or is there a, do we have to vote to no. table something? We do have to vote to table it? Or can we just say we're tabling it? I think we can just table it. Okay. Okay. Um, if you well, want me to just roll that. into the yes. other two. Okay. That would be great. Um, so these ones, um, I think we'll start with um, the one that I think is slightly easier for now. Um, well, no, they're both, they're both pretty simple. So uh, one of them is is JLCA, which is our physical examination requirement. We're calling it now physical examination requirement and sharing information between school and home. Um, and what this is, is there are updates to the process by which families are sharing with the schools uh, the most recent uh, health examination of the student in order for them to participate in certain school activities. Um, so at this time, we're raising it to the board to sort of bring it to the board's attention and the public's attention that there's pending changes to this policy, which will change the way um, the timing uh, um, of, the, of the sharing of the information. Um, and we're not looking to bring it back to vote and approve this year because it will not, we don't want it to go into effect until September of, of the new school year. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions or comments on that. I hope if you don't mind, I just want to reiterate to anybody listening and the board that um, this policy was worked on by our school nurses. It has um, the most effect on our school athletes and um, we are just raising it at this time to make people aware that really the timing around um, when you are, when a student needs to have a physical on file um, is changing. And we're not looking to put it into effect right away, but we want people to be aware. So that was why we wanted to bring it up at the meeting tonight. We want to, the public to have an understanding that there is going to be a change but um, we're not mandating it for the fall sports season, basically. Right, because it, um, anticipating that people won't be able to get their students in for exams this summer, and it's just gonna be a, a, uh, a bit messy to, to try to put it in place right away. Um, so then the other one for first read is um, IKF, which is the graduation requirements. And this one is critical for us to have in place before the end of this year. So this is the first read. And um, Kathy, I don't know if you want to comment on what's, what's been done here. Do you, do you want me to project it or? Um, yeah, if you can do that, that would be ideal probably so people can see it okay oh i need to be made a co-host again okay i'll do that can you all see it in your packets or you can okay are you all set kathy did that work i am yes thank you okay, okay. Right. Um, so the current policy was um, crafted to implement proficiency based education and that statute was repealed last year. And so this revision honors um, some of the good work that was done in clarifying that <clears throat> We want, um, we want our students to 
demonstrate proficiency to the um, to the main learning results, which um, would include the content standards and the guiding principles. And that is done um, through teachers aligning their courses um, um, and their assessments to the main learning results. Um, and then so that a passing grade in a course to those means that you have demonstrated proficiency. And so that is acknowledged here in the introduction, but then what we eliminated was um, just all of this language rolling out implementation where a content area was added each year. Um, and instead we're returning to, and I apologize, I realize this is, there we go. Um, it can be challenging to watch as someone is scrolling. Um, but so we're returning to the um, credit requirements um, that we had prior to this most recent version of the graduation policy. Um, and so for any of you who had children when that other policy was in play, this will look familiar to you. Um, so in addition to um, the, the restoration of the credits, but bearing in mind that we are retaining that connection to the main learning results, we also added in language about the, um, for students who are identified for special education, the, um, the requirements specified inside their IEP would be, would be their, their graduation requirements. Um, and then we retained the language around multiple pathways um, so that students are able to earn credit in a variety of ways um, and not just through courses at Cape Elizabeth High School. And then we also added in language that's statutory that had just not been added before around veterans who left in order to serve in, a, in an armed conflict, being able to earn a Cape Elizabeth High School diploma. <coughs> that's essentially that. I'll, I'll unshare and can- uh, Kathy, do you, wanna, do you wanna talk about um, the, the uh, homeschooled students piece? Oh, did I change? Leave that out. Yes, thank you. Actually, that's something I think that you and Jeff worked on. Um, but let me find it. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to speak to that or? At, um, so, um, just the concern, what, what led to this change? Yeah, so um, I believe previously it just, <clears throat> it just said that this uh, homeschooled student must um, attend uh, a minimum of two school, semesters. Minimum of two semesters um, in order to receive a diploma. And we've had some, um, some concerns about that. And Jeff and I have been talking about it a lot this year and um, decided that that really should, um, should be changed to uh, include their senior year. Um, as it is now, um, it could be a random two semesters um, in order to receive a diploma. It could be a, the first semester of their freshman year and then if they want a diploma, they might wanna just come back for the, first, for the second semester of their senior year. Um, we, we felt that it, it um, made more sense for them to spend their entire senior year uh, at Cape Elizabeth High School. We felt much more comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kathy and Donna. Do you have, did you have any other comments you wanted to add, Kathy, or I think that, Donna? I think that's about it. Okay, we, um, and then otherwise we sort of cleaned up the preamble and took out some sort of, um, uh, the, the, the requirements are in the handbook ultimately, and that's just sort of a, the state of the world. And we took out some sort of superfluous language that had uh, requirements around that. Um, so this one we have to have done by the end of the year. So we'll bring it back next month. And if anyone has any comments or questions, um, we'll be discussing it at the next policy meeting. 
at the end of April. Okay. Thank you, Hope. And Elizabeth and Donna. Um, so the next item, item eight, is school board agenda requests. Are there any requests? I don't see any. Uh, committee reports policy, I think you're probably all set, Hope. Am I correct? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's correct. Technology. Not sure we have more to fill in except that they're doing an amazing job and that they've been stretched and challenged and it sounds like showing up fully for it all. Thanks again to all of them. Because of the pandemic, um, the last one got canceled. Student wellness is not happening currently. Buildings and grounds is not happening. That's on hold as of right currently due to the COVID-19. Uh, legislative liaison is not pertinent right now either. Uh, announcements for upcoming meetings. We have a school board budget presentation to town council. It's Monday, April 27th, 2020 at 6.30 via Zoom. Um, Elizabeth, Heather, I had a question about that. Sorry, yep. So um, I wanted to ask Donna, uh, is there, has there been any conversation um, with uh, town manager Matt Sturgis or the town council at all about the fact that Governor Mills has issued an executive order moving the primary election to July 14th? And so uh, obviously there's going to have to be either some sort of forgiveness around the law that says the the town council has to, you know, they have to move the budget to referendum, you know, within 30 days of the election and that sort of thing. So my question is, at this time, are, uh, are we still presenting our budget on April 27th? Um, and then, you know, are, are they keeping to the schedule? Because I just don't know how we can do that. I don't have an answer for that. I haven't heard otherwise that um, the last I talked to Matt, he was expecting the 27th presentation. Um. Okay. But my guess is that this is a fluid conversation that we will adapt and, and shift as needed, Elizabeth, because okay. you're right there. There's a time frame, a legality there that either needs to be waived potentially. Um, or moved. Yeah. Or, or moved and so we have to we will have to keep abreast of this and paying attention to this so thank you for bringing it up absolutely donna i'll check with matt tomorrow and see if he's heard anything else um i've talked to him almost daily so great well i i guess i just want to kind of get my head around it a little bit because it does um take quite a bit of preparation to make that presentation to the town council um and the school board usually does attend um sort of in support and um, wondering, you know, if, if we don't have a waiver for the legal requirement in the number of days, then is it the best idea to present when there's such a long time in between when we present the information and when the town council will be allowed to vote on it, that sort of thing. Those are the questions. Yeah, and those are important questions but it doesn't sound like there's answers from tonight, but it's good to be thinking about them and having them on our minds. Yes, Donna. Well, last I heard, um, there was a waiver, there's a waiver on the governor's desk, but it hasn't been signed yet, so. Okay. So hopefully some information forthcoming. Hopefully. Um, all right, so, but as of right now, April 27th at 6.30 via Zoom, um, policy committee, hope um, Tuesday, April 28th at three o'clock via Zoom. Uh, town council public hearings on the budget currently are scheduled for Monday, May 4th, 2020 via Zoom at seven o'clock. And town council meeting to adopt the adoption of the municipal and CESD budgets 
Monday, May 11th, 2020 at seven o'clock via Zoom. So, um, some big stuff coming up. The next phase, I feel like, of this budget process, right? Thank you again. Do we have a motion for item 11? I move we adjourn. Can I have a second? I second. Thank you, Laura. And I guess we have to go through, though it's not here on the agenda, but I'll just go through. Heather Altenberg, yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. <laughs> Uh, Phil Saucier. Yay. Uh, Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser Shear. Yay. And Hope Straw. Yay. Laura. Thank you for all who attended. Thank you for being here. I hope everybody is healthy and doing well. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good, Good night, night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. And people are gone. Good night. You know what I have to do? Wait, I have to press forward.